Man, at everyone in my life, if they could stop reminding me that I am no longer like a youthful cherub. When were you ever a cherub? <laughs> Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Alien Familiar RPG Podcast. I am Clayton. I'm Kyle Perkins. I'm Nina. I'm Jordan. Before we get started, I just want to remind all of our listeners that you can find show notes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com, and we are on Facebook at facebook.com slash alienfamiliar. And I didn't strike my pose before I started doing that, and I did not do that all in one breath. <laughs> Our topic for today is going to be horror, heartbreak, and fun, the emotional rewards of tragedy in RPGs. And before we even get started talking about this topic, I want to say something about some things that we have already said on this podcast in our previous episodes about things that have been tragic that have happened to our characters and kind of put that into a particular frame of light in regards to this particular conversation, because we have had many times on this show already where people have talked about awful things that have happened to their characters, tragedies that have happened to their characters. And every single time the person talking about it has talked about how awful it was, how terrible it was, they put it in such a negative light that as I was sitting around the table watching the person inter tell this story, just watching their face light up in telling the story and the emotions of them telling the story completely betrayed everything that they were saying. They were saying how awful it was, but all of their, in their tonal inflections, all of their facial expressions were talking about how awesome it was. And I just want to make that distinction up front that while things are awful for your characters, it's always something that the player can do to make an awesome gaming experience. This is like when I have sex with people, like they're telling me like, this is the worst. I, this is really, really boring. I please get off. But I can tell from their body expressions and the way they are, they're sounding. It's they're a great time. So, and it's all consensual. I'm not getting weird with this. I'm just saying that I'm really bad at sex. Not getting weird with this. <laughs> freaking story. So the person you're having sex with is like, get off, get off. And you're like, I'm trying. <laughs> Horror, heartbreak, and RPGs. <laughs> this derailed quick. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. We're talking about personal stories. I just told some very personal stories. <laughs> I think that we could just kick it off with some, some great times we've had surrounding tragic or unexpectedly bad events in RPGs. If anybody else doesn't want to start off with some, I have one. I mean, you've really commandeered the floor. I didn't mean so. to. I really was trying to open it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, nobody else wants to. Um, Set the tone. It's a hard act to follow, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk about something that happened at character creation for me. I actually have a couple of uh, instances here, but let's go with um, yeah. Let's 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 go with Traveler. So, if anyone's unfamiliar with Traveler, it is a game where your first session of the game is character creation. Is that accurate, Clayton? Like that's it's it's a, basically a full session. Yes, uh, character creation is its own mini game in Traveler. Like you you could play the game after doing the character creation session, but character creation takes several hours depending on the amount of players you have. Um, you essentially choose a career path or goal for your character. In my case, I desperately wanted to be a member of the Scouts. Yes. The Scouts are a branch of the spacefaring military um, in this universe. Um, humanity has spread across several star systems. And the Scouts, they push the boundaries. They go to the edge of known space, and they you know go beyond it, seeking... Um, new life and new civilizations. It sounded awesome. Naturally, I wanted to be a member of the Scouts. So I roll for it. And I actually do pretty well. I, there's a couple of hardships along the way. You have to roll at different like stages of your development. And you go around the table and everyone's trying different things. Um, you can die, by the way, during character creation in Traveler, which is pretty awesome. 
Um, you can hit, like, weird mishaps, get into a dueling accident, lose a limb, go bankrupt, end up in a, as a, as a, like, a total drifter loser who's just the worst character, um, statistically. Um, I guess you could be dead. That might be the worst character. But, um, I, I wanted to be in the Scouts. I rolled for it. I went through, like, early development, went into the Academy. Um, I had a few, like, close calls along the way, but I made it through the Academy, and then the, the hardest role to make here was to actually get into the Scouts, which I did. And I get my first command. And on my very first mission, which I'm rolling for as part of my character development here, this isn't the actual game. This is still character creation. On my very first mission, I encounter, like, a first contact situation, which is awesome. Which is the best thing you could do as a member of the Scouts. And, as a result, I roll very poorly, bad things happen, um, I lose my ship, but manage to get most of my crew out alive, and then in the tribunal that happens, I could either throw my commanding officer under the bus, or take responsibility? Yep. And, do you remember which one I chose? You took responsibility for the, for the mishap. I took responsibility for the mishap. I forget what the outcome was if I threw my commander under the bus. Well, but, you didn't um, know beforehand what that outcome was going to be. I had you choose <clears throat> which outcome you were going to take before telling you the consequences of that action. Right. Um, and long story short, um, I get fucking kicked out of the scouts in disgrace. I do get to keep my like service pistol, which is a decent weapon to start the game with. But just just an absolute... Rise to glory, and then an immediate fall to the depths of despair. All in character creation. And then we have to start the game. Meanwhile, we've got somebody on our crew who was like a dilettante, and was fabulously wealthy, and a uh, hundred plus years old, but had the money to take age reduction therapy, so he looked like 30. And um, he's doing great. <laughs> as um, long as he gets his meds. Yeah. And... Um, I just am unsure what to do with myself. I don't even remember what my skill set was, to be honest, in that game. It was a fun game, though. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Like, that, that, that kind of roller coaster ride, all during character creation, really helps you to create a character that feels real. They've had a history, they've had a life, they've had good and bad things happen to them, and it really colors the way you play that person in Traveler. It's a, it, I recommend anybody listening to this do a session of Traveler character creation. Find a rule book. Do character creation. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be a good time. Do not play Traveler 5. <laughs> Why not? Because it is awful. Play Mongoose Traveler. You're speaking words to me here, but I don't know what any of them mean. <laughs> well, if you go to uh, buy or download <clears throat> a core rule book of Traveler, look for one that is by Mongoose Publishing. Those are the best ones. Is Traveler 5 newer? No. The di- the editions of Traveler are so Byzantine, I cannot <laughs> even begin to understand them. But the most the three most recent editions of Traveler, going backward, are Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition, Traveler 5, and Mongoose Traveler, going backwards. So I don't remember who published Traveler 5, but it is this massive tome and by all accounts, it is an awful game system. Hmm. Mongoose Traveler is what we played. So kind of along your lines of just the results of bad roles and then the player's decision on using those roles to influence the character going forward, um, I'm reminded of some... There was one single bad role that I made that completely made for the entirety of the session where I was playing in... Dungeons and Dragons third edition. This was um, my character was a half orc wizard, and this character failed on a charm person spell. When my character failed, the spellcaster who we were fighting at the time managed to convince my character that all of his companions, all of the other player characters, were that I should not trust them, that I should do anything I can to oppose them from hurting my good friend. And so, because the spell has a duration of hours based on the level of the caster, and the and the caster got away, he teleported away, 
my character was stuck for several hours just absolutely hating all the players in the party. Immediately after the fight, I get into a fight with the other player characters because of all this shit that has gone down. Completely role-playing, I'm... The other player characters were my friends, so I wasn't, like, unleashing spells on them. But I was a half-orc, so I was pretty strong. So I was able to get into melee pretty well with most of the party, except for the fighter. And so I'm just I'm just going off and slugging my companions. They managed to tackle me and subdue me, and they talk to me for a while. And I'm, I'm like, okay, okay, guys, I'm, I'm cold down, I'm done, I'm done fighting. I convince them to let me go, and the moment they let me go, I'm still under the effects of this spell. I still absolutely hate my friends for what they've done. So then I start unleashing uh, non-damaging spells upon them, like sleep and um, cause fatigue or other things. And the fact that I was... The whole way it played out in which I was just fighting the entire session with my fellow players... Everybody, we all had a great time playing it, and this is probably the most rambly speed, uh, this is the most rambly story that I've ever told on this podcast, and it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> so I'm probably gonna end up cutting this out. Those are broke. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, let me jump in there. Um, my most recent version of this was, um, probably in Abena, when I got to a point where I was Getting kind of bored with the character that I was playing. I was playing a wizard, um, kind of the only one in the group, really. And I'd done most of the things that I wanted to do, except for the, you know, main ultimate story goal stuff. And so when we were fighting a dragon that was mopping the floor with all of us, I just decided to phase right into the thing and then solidify knowing full well it was going to kill me, it's expressly laid out that way in the rules. Also knowing that I had a ring that would regenerate, but I didn't know if it would resurrect. I had no idea, and I was kind of ready to to die if that's what was going to happen. I spent, like, sessions, like, just kind of floating around, like, pretending to be a ghost after that. But, like, having that cool thing happen, the kamikaze run, like, suicide death, was probably my favorite thing that that character did. Amongst a bunch of stuff that was just sort of like scripted, what's your Jedi Master response to a given thing? And so, like, yeah, it it saved people or whatever, but I fucking killed myself. <laughs> and I was <laughs> gone for a long time in in the wake of that. So, I don't know, I think, I think that's an example of one of those things where, like, victory is like your standard slay the beast, you know, and walk away victorious with the princess on your arm is not the only way to deal with things and is really kind of cliche and uninteresting. Think about the interesting things that that campaign, or rather that, that you pulled from that campaign um, because you chose to do that. We, we could have killed the dragon some other way. We were in a tight spot. It was looking rough. We might have had um, maybe a, a player death. I don't think we were going to total party kill. Do you agree, Clayton, as the DM for that session? You guys had enough going for you that it was very unlikely that a TPK was going to happen. So, tragedy might have occurred, but it would have been tragedy in the form of, ah, man, well, i got to roll a new character now. And, and in that game, our characters were very close, so it would have been tragic, but still interesting. We wouldn't have wiped. But instead, you chose this wacky alternative where it might have been a player death for you, and you would have had to have rolled a new character, and that would have been, you know, uh, sad in character. But I can't think of a, a single better example of a, a party doing a great job of not metagaming than you being dead. Like, there were definitely some times when a few of us metagamed, um, oh yeah, knowing, that was a beer cracking in case you're wondering, um, knowing that you were, that Talon was dead, but you were still doing things behind the scenes that we weren't sure of. A few people got kind of salty about it, and I do think that they brought in a little bit of metagaminess once Talon reappeared. Because really, to be completely metagame-free, everyone should have thought you were dead. But everyone knew that Jordan was still controlling a character walking around as a fucking <laughs> ghost doing shit. Right, I'm still going to show up to the game every week. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to stay home. Yeah. Um, 
but but overall, on the whole, it was really awesome to have to keep up this this act, both out of character, because everyone knew that Talon was alive, or at least Jordan was there doing something, you know, whispering to Clayton. But in character, keeping up the ruse, Alkir pretty much knew you were alive. My my character had a couple of psychic visions from you, um, and... Wasn't it a couple of sessions after that, though, before that started happening? Yeah, but then there, there was still a good three or so sessions where I was pretty certain you were alive. Yeah. Alkir was. Um, and so keeping up that ruse in and out of character was super fun and super fascinating, and we would not have been able to do that were it not for the tragedy of a seemingly dead player character. I, I'm curious for our listeners if if their experience is playing in games where player death is super rare, or if they play in games where player death is super common. I feel like that could be an interesting topic uh, all of its own, perhaps. Maybe uh, maybe our first listener call in. Whoa, <laughs> we'll write in. You write us an email, and we'll we'll, we'll talk about your story. I think the tendency in most games is for player death to be super rare, especially looking at like the the newer editions of D and D. It seems like they kind of bend over backwards to make it a lot like um, like the superhero role playing games, where you're ten times more likely to just get knocked out of the fight, you know, go unconscious or whatever, than to actually fucking bleed out and die. A lot of newer role playing games tend to seem a lot safer. Yeah, it's been a while since the first level wizards charted with just 1d4 hit points without any modifiers. <laughs> yep. that, that is actually rolled. Yep. <laughs> Woo, I rolled a 4. <laughs> it's better than rolling a 1. <laughs> well, the only thing worse than a wizard rolling 1 on his hit die is a fighter rolling a 1 on his hit die. I think that builds character. Do you have any stories of tragedy? I think the only... As as a, like a newish player at RPGs, like the only tragedy that I can think of that happened in game, as opposed to like in character creation, like I always start my characters off with some type of horrifying thing that happened in their past. Ivy got bit by a werewolf and abandoned by her parents. Um, my character in Eclipse phase is a mess. <laughs> um, but the tragedy that I can think of right now that happened in game was in the factions game uh, of Apocalyptia near. I think it was maybe in the last battle, or like the second to last battle or something. My character's lieutenant got shot in the head, and that completely changed the end game because well for me at least, because the idea was that I me and Kyle Driscoll's character, um, Isaac, we we had gotten together and we were gonna run away, but the only thing keeping me there was Jameson, and I feel like having him being killed by one of the the blood fucks. Mm-hmm. Uh, particularly when working with Jimmy Hawk, it drew me closer, drove me closer to Isaac, and which made us run away to Maine. And it also drove me closer to Jimmy Hawk because you had to tell me about it. That was no fun. That was that was the last battle. Was and it? There was also. that guy was um, that guy was your wingman mm-hmm. and your brother who had been turned shot him mm-hmm. like. And was going to shoot you next, and then your next. I think didn't Jameson like? Didn't he <clears throat> save your life by doing that? Um, we were both in a like uh, semi truck cab that had been converted into like a war rig, mm-hmm. and Jameson was up top on the fifty, mm-hmm. and uh, Jimmy Hawk was driving, and um, I had backed up to the town wall, and Jameson opened up with the fifty on like the horde of you know infected, and then I was crawling up to the cab to bring my sniper rifle to bear, and. Uh, I literally, you told me like you you rolled some stuff. You kind of chuckled, I think, and then you told me so. Jimmy Hawk is suddenly wet, and I'm like, what? Like I'm horny? <laughs> no, <laughs> negative. You've been sprayed by brains and blood. My favorite way to be wet, I say. <laughs> um, and yeah, fucking out of nowhere, just just boom, dead. Mm-hmm. And the the heroism there was that, like, no one else... Like, we were about to be overrun, and so, like, no one else really volunteered to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, but Jameson, you know, in character, like, I think... I, I might have asked you if, like, this is something he would do. Of I don't course remember. he would do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so then he, he went with Jimmy Hawk to the, to the, to the wall. Yeah, and but, it, was, um, it was heartbreaking. Jameson in, was the character that Andy found when they were both, like, ten and orphans of the apocalypse, and mm-hmm. they've been together since the beginning. Mm-hmm. And they started this, like, weird child gang of punks <laughs> together. Like, 
They were they were brother and sister, and it was just heartbreaking. And I hate you for it. <laughs> you say you with say a smile it. on your <laughs> face. <laughs> a smile on your face and a chuckle in your mouth. Well, it did laugh. make my it did make Andy's like ending of that um, game a lot ha- happier. This is stra- this is a strange way to go about this because if Jameson didn't die, she would have stayed at uh, Little Athens, and she would have. Not been a happy person yeah. at all, but like we got to, me and Isaac got to escape to Maine because it was closer to California <laughs> and also really pretty. <laughs> Thought process was not deep there, but yeah, we got to get out. And uh, there was another right. tragedy in that campaign that we all lived through. Some of us barely when the bomb went off at the Balchatri. Mm-hmm. Oh, I yeah. lost a limb. I don't remember how bad any of anybody else got it, but I, my character lost his left arm. And very nearly died from a head wound, in addition to losing his arm. And at, after that, my character got real cold. It was mm-hmm. after that that I implemented the worst aspects of uh, <laughs> Seth Big Smile's uh, plan to take over Little Athens. It was after that that he came up with the plan of how to eliminate the army out in the field for whenever he did his... Um, when he, whenever he was going to do his eventual coup, which never came to fruition. I don't know if I ever told anyone this, what his plan was to get everybody else killed, but I scouted out a hotel and I started to dress it up to look like it was um, being inhabited by blood fucks. I was taking bodies that I had found, animals I had found, and just like just spreading their guts out all over everything so that it looked like it was... Um, Inhabited by blood fucks. It's kind of messed and up. It gets worse. Oh, okay. Inside the hotel, I just planted a shit ton of explosives. Or I was in the process of planting a shit ton of explosives. And then I was going to go back and tell everybody, hey, I found this big blood fuck stin. We needed to go hit it because our previous time we had gone to hit the blood fucks, we had sent all of our melee people in. And all of our ranged people out stayed outside to hit any stragglers, where the majority of people were kind of in a line around it. And then all of my people who had sniper rifles were behind that first line. So I was going to send all of the melee people into the hotel. Well, there was Haley's below faction. The, Haley's faction, and um, there was more than just Haley's faction that was melee. My like, faction. There was, yeah. Your faction didn't fight. No, we didn't fight, but, like, push come to shove, we were... The reason we didn't fight is because we were mostly melee characters. Mm. I mean, Jameson and Axel were, like, pretty skilled with rifles, and so was I, but no. No, I wasn't. Oh, I don't remember. Anyway, uh, we were we were mostly melee characters. Mm-hmm. That's why we didn't fight. It would have been dumb. So Many factions would have gone down. Yep. I would have <clears throat> blown up everybody who was in there, anyone. And then my troops had the order to just start shooting in the back... All of the, um, all of our allies who were standing there watching the entrance, wondering what the hell just happened with this explosion, they were all going to get shot in the back. And then I had enough time and distance that if anybody, if any melee characters didn't die in the initial explosion, they had to run to us to do anything. So we were just going to pick them off as they came running. Hey, Clayton, that was kind of terrifying. That was a good plan. It was a good plan. <laughs> Um, it was instead, the, you just kind of got the city handed to you. Uh, what was left of it? Yeah, fucking everybody abandoned me. <laughs> if, uh, well. if I hadn't been so fucked up in that final battle, I would have like taken a um, <laughs> sniper's perch and just started picking people off as they rode off into the sunset toward me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, also, okay. Also, abandoning abandoning hundreds of people who were down in the um, in the tunnels. Yep. Also, it was that Bolshatri bombing that, that crippled Kyle Driscoll's initial mm-hmm. character, who was the matriarch of his faction, then prompting him to play the, you know, more or less crown prince of his faction. <laughs> the Joffrey, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Which which became your significant other yeah. and led into your guys' story. That, um, I didn't realize when I'd planned that whole thing out what a, what a huge event that was going to be. Mm-hmm. That was one of those narrative things where I'm just like, I'm just going to roll the dice and see how this works out. I had no idea what everybody, what was going to happen to everyone. It's just, all right, here's damage on Clayton and damage on Kyle and damage on Nina. And let's just see how this thing goes. My little 
youngest one died in in in, in that game, didn't she? I believe so. The sweet little like ten year old. Mm-hmm. Like, oh my god, I forgot about that. Yeah. Screw you, Jordan. <laughs> Shit happens. I don't remember her name, but she was lovely. <laughs> Useless, <laughs> but lovely. In playing a role playing game, you have hundreds of opportunities to succeed or fail on given tasks. And most of them are just mundane things that really don't matter. And even the fairly important things very rarely stick with you when you've succeeded. You go into it with the assumption that you are the hero, and so you are going to slay the villain or whatever. But it's when that goes off the rails and shit goes sideways that... You remember what happened, for one thing, because it's jarring. It it directly smashes into your expectations. And then it causes you to improvise. You're you're on your back foot. And if it's impactful enough, if it touches, you know, other parts of your life, people that you care about, whatever, that's when you have to reassess who you are. That's That's character growth. That's what progress is. Somebody that succeeds all the time is boring. It's predictable. There's no drama there. I would like to quote someone here for a second in that tragedy is a flashpoint from which character growth occurs. And I think that the stories that we've told is definitely a an indication that being able to just take and run with the bad things that happen, reflect on those is t- like kind of going back to our episode about how to allow character growth. Being open to these experiences are what allow your characters to grow in interesting ways. Because you really can't predict, you can't predict what's going to hit you in the campaign. Like in our examples, the ways in which we ref- these events happen and that we react to them allows for greater character growth. Jordan, your, your example of Talon, I feel like your character actually became interesting after your character experienced death a million times. Agreed. Yeah. For those out of the loop, Talon died, went to the afterlife, the ring revived him, and then this happened uh, thousands of times. He was inside of a dragon, inside of a kraken, on the bottom of the ocean. The old turducken, if you will. (laughs) I, I phase. I, I teleported above the dragon, dropped into it, phased, and then solidified, killing both of us. The dragon falls into the ocean, and then gets eaten by a kraken that's underneath it. And so I'm in two stomachs simultaneously, with a ring that, no matter what I do, keeps regenerating me back to life. And so, in Clayton left it up to me to determine what the afterlife was like in this <clears throat> game which is hilarious that I'm the one that gets to do this, because I also designed the goddess of death. And so my whole thing was, all right, you live your whole life backwards and then get unborn back into the, you know, inverted womb of the inverted mother over and over again. So every time I fucking wake up, I die and relive my 60 years or whatever the fucking half elf lifespan was over and over again. And I, I sat and worked it out, like, rough estimates one time, like, how long it would take me having, like, a couple minutes of life before I drown again to cut a little bit out of that shit and then die again and live the whole fucking life again. And it was, like, hundreds and hundreds of years that I'm experiencing as a consciousness until I eventually fucking get the hell out and manage to stop drowning on repeat. And I wasn't just being a dick for having your character get swallowed by a kraken. The, the kraken was under control of an ally in this big naval battle that was going on. So these were all set pieces that were there and in motion. You guys were fighting the dragons um, in the air. The krakens were fighting for your allies below. Yep. Yeah, and anything that fell into the water, the krakens just you know vacuumed up, including a talon and a dragon. Yep. Why didn't we think of Tade Dragkin? It's like a turducken, but it's t- t- dragon. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think um, I think one of the false assumptions that people come to in any kind of game or any kind of fiction, really, that's interactive, is that we only have this one word, fun, to describe what a quality experience in these things are, and by 
I don't know, tradition or something, we assume that that just means succeeding at your goals. But, like I was saying, that's boring. Anybody can imagine a story where a character just succeeds at everything. Who wants to fucking read that? Nobody. The successes aren't what's interesting. So tragedy in characters is... It really mirrors like in movies, where people don't go to see fun movies. I mean, there are just fun movies made, but they're like horror... Most, like, sad, like, weepy chick flicks, they're, those are not fun experiences, but we go there to enjoy them. Mm-hmm. And all of these bad things that happen to our characters, we're going there to vicariously experiencing, experience these, these heights of emotion. And the heights of emotion themselves are a good experience. I mean, that's why people go out and do extreme shit like skydiving, anything that gives them an, an enhanced, enhanced awareness or enhanced, um, experience. That's why people go out and do these things. And that's part of why we play role playing games, that it is another form of this emotional high that we are always, that a lot of people just constantly seek and is a part of human experience. Yeah, that's what I was trying to, to get at. Is it's not the the amount of success that you have. It's the the range and the the extreme. If you think about it, like a sine wave between success and failure, you know, it's it's how high the peaks are and how low the valleys are that makes something memorable. Um, if you just have one constant long peak of success, or on the inverse, some really miserable experience of just constant failure, which I've also had with game systems where you have to roll your attributes and wind up with some dog shit hobo character. It's just not fun. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to have that, that roller coaster ride to, to make anything memorable and, and interesting. So although the game's been on hold for a couple of weeks now, um, recently, Jordan, you said to me about Eclipse Phase that you had to make a new character because you had created a a character with great propensity for evil deeds, mm-hmm. which I think is an awesome character. Like, the the ability to... Basically, the ultimate assassin type of, of person. Uh, look like anybody, uh, poison claws, infiltrate, bring them down from the inside. Poison and, claws? And basically, you had said that that character is too dark for a world that is extremely dark, and you weren't able to have any fun and see any light at all. Mm -hmm. And Eclipse Phase is a very bleak universe where, as you put it, it seems pretty true, at least in the the, the version we're playing, um, many things have been done, and humanity is just this immortal, hedonistic burnout that is going nowhere, and any chance that, you know, and any opportunity that seems like it could lead somewhere, like, hey, we've discovered a new world through these Pandora gates. Oh, but wait, uh, you know, there's already people there doing weird shit. Like, what's the point? Do you think we can recover from that? Is it too dark? Do you think that, you know, a different character will help you? Like, what are some ways to have a, a setting that is bleak? And there are lots of them. Warhammer 40k, and I can name a few more make them have those glimmers of hope and the bleakness so that it, it you know it doesn't all blend together. Well, I hate Warhammer 40k, so I'm just going to put that aside as being an unrecoverable setting. I, I can't stand it. Didn't know that. Yeah, I really don't like it at all. Hmm. <laughs> it's awful. It should stay a tabletop war game. As, as for Eclipse Phase, there's two different complaints that I have about Eclipse Phase. One's the system that we've gone over but the system reflects the world really well. That's a compliment that I'll pay it, is that they've got a game system that I think really jives with the setting, where everything is just unbelievably complicated. There's layers and layers and layers on top of everything, and you feel like you're drowning in all of the crap that's going on in the world around you. It's total paralysis in the face of all this sensory overload. And that's fine. That's a, a fairly common trope in uh, cyberpunk fiction. I, I get that. I fucked up making a character that, by all rights, should have been a villain. 
I, I think I made somebody that is, that is really hard for me as a person to empathize with or, you know, enjoy in any kind of like progressing storyline. Like I made a killing machine. So I, I'll hand that one over to you and do with it what you will. The whole thing about cyberpunk, and I love cyberpunk as a setting. It's one of my easily top three favorite kinds of settings is that it's a struggle to retain humanity. One thing I don't like about Eclipse Phase, though, is that it pretty much assumes that that's a foregone conclusion. Eclipse Phase is kind of post-cyberpunk. It's like, well, the transhuman thing is a reality. It's no longer like, it's no longer like the 80s cyberpunk uh, Blade Runner kind of thing where we have to face the the implications of, you know, artificial intelligence and synthetic life forms and whatever. It's like, this is the norm. And if you are not this, then something is weird about you and you're way behind the curve. It's a lot more like uh, the Ghost in the Shell anime stuff is. It, it as well is that post-cyberpunk kind of thing. And it's it's hard for me to see in Eclipse Phase, where any kind of player agency comes in, because everything is so titanic around you. And though everybody on an individual scale is more or less at parity with their powers, because everyone has access to, you know, extremely advanced technology, the institutions, the mega corporations, the, you know, whatever, planetary governments or whatever, are so huge that I don't see any any levers to be pulled, narratively speaking, that would make any difference to anything. It looks like anything that we would do would just be absorbed into the the chaos that is this weird dead-end loop that humanity has gotten themselves into. Excuse me, while we're on this tangent, um, I'll bring it back home, but, but keep on this topic. One way to play a, an Eclipse Phase game that is more Blade Runner-ish, more humanity-facing the reality of the transhuman movement... Um, would be to play the Jovian faction. They're a major faction in Eclipse Phase. Everyone else, like you said, looks at them as being backwards and extremely tragic and enslaved and um, uh, manipulated, abused. But from the Jovian standpoint, they're the last bastion of humanity. Mm -hmm. They're the only people who are still people. I could see a far more uh, a far more relatable story coming out of a Jovian game of Eclipse Phase than the one that we're playing, where it is difficult to relate. But to bring it back home here and wrap up my Eclipse Phase tangent as well, and in one swift stroke, hopefully, I think that, much like real life, uh, you need to ignore all these titanic forces and think more about your own personal story within that. And I know that for some characters and for some people, it's difficult to not myself included, think about these forces at play in life that you can't do a damn thing about and look at the room you're in and the people you're with and just focus on that. But I, I, I like that Eclipse Phase, that is the struggle, is finding the personal human story and tragedies in a world where you're immortal. You know, death means nothing. That, that's, that's a challenge to DM and, and to play in both, something like that. But it, if if someone's willing, I think it's it's awesome. It's really fun, and it leads for some really interesting take on tragedy and certainly on horror. Mm -hmm. um, Eclipse Phase by itself is horrific, my God. Mm -hmm. But tragedy wise, I, I could I could kill all of you motherfuckers, and mm -hmm. and it wouldn't matter because most of you have insurance. Even if you don't, like someone can come along and pick up your cortical stack and pop it into another body, and you're fine. You're all right. Um, That's. That is the horror of Eclipse Phase to me, is that ultimately there aren't any consequences for anything, and because of that, there's no progress to be made anywhere. And I, I feel like maybe on the short term, it would become this, like, Call of Duty kind of scenario where everybody's just blowing each other away because nothing matters and you're going to respawn in however long. And then eventually that would burn itself out, and it would be something like the Q Continuum, where everyone's just sort of standing around because it doesn't matter what you do, because nothing fucking matters. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, with without that, like, mortal baseline as an, as an assumption, 
I, I can't wrap my head around what the human condition is like day to day in eclipse phase. What's the work a day life of someone anywhere in eclipse phase when there is no scarcity, there is no mortality. Like, who gives a fuck? Or are you all just like, uh, that old Woody Allen movie where people are just sitting around with a pleasure orb thing? Sleeper. Sleeper, yeah. Like, is that what we're at, where we're just constantly trying to ratchet up the the pleasure centers until we fry ourselves or not? Like, Also the plot of William Shatner's 1970s book series, Tech War. <laughs> that was made into a TV series on USA in the 90s. Yeah, you was it? that all the time. Oh. Uh... Was it? Oh, yeah. yeah. There was William Shatner in it? it sure was. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> I had no idea. You just made my day. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. I have a first edition hardback of the first one that I've always wanted that man to sign. At William Shatner, don't die yet. Don't die on me, you glorious bastard. you got to sign my first copy of Tech War. He's going to be the first transhuman. <laughs> it's true. He's, Did you tight, see that? he's tight with Kurzweil, man. He's, he's going to be the first one to sleep. Did you see the photo? Uh, I think it came out today of the Star Trek Discovery cast with uh, Shatner and Nichelle Nichols looking like Shatner and Nichelle are real old, but they're looking real happy. Like they look like they're having a great fucking time. And then it's a bunch of like young new actors in the Star Trek film just trying to be like, oh yes, look at me, look how awesome I am. I look great. <laughs> just, 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 just old, you know, fat Shatner and, and Nichelle Nichols just there like this is great. <laughs> it's 2017 and we're still doing Star Trek. <laughs> Also, your reaction when you see Star Trek things? <laughs> I actually uh, could really go into a discourse about how uh, disappointed I am in where Discovery is going. Can, can't you ever just be happy? Just wondering. No tragedy in in life. It makes it interesting. It makes me interesting. <laughs> Bad Star Trek is better than no Star Trek. <sighs> I'm with Clayton. I don't know would if you I say have... the same thing about Star Wars. No. <laughs> okay, I would. So. I, I never had the amount of love for Star Wars that I have for Star Trek. I feel you. It's like saying bad pie is better than no pie. It is. Like, you get a really bad apple pie from, like, a gas station because you made a mistake at two in the morning. Mm. Nobody but then, wants that. But then you got food and a story. It pinch, eventually, the pie is just a parody, uh, and then the pie is a lie. Well, when you get into parody, yes, no Orville was better than some Orville. <laughs> <laughs> You're not looking forward to the Orville? I watched the first episode. It's out? Yeah. I'm behind the times. Uh, is it bad? Oh my god, it's bad. Ooh. Man, a lot of Trek fans who are like... I, I can't tell if if uh, Seth... Uh, what's his last name? No, see, I can't tell if Seth MacFarlane is pandering to his audience or insulting his audience throughout the entire episode. I cannot tell the difference. I cannot tell what he's doing. He is definitely doing one of them. <laughs> a lot of Trek fans who are real salty about Discovery were trying to kind of subvert at least the subreddit for Star Trek, the main one, to be like, look, guys, just just watch the Orville instead. It's going to be great. Maybe they're all just McFarlane shills. The music is like, it's almost Star Trek hmm. throughout so, the entire thing. Okay, so Galaxy Quest did this right. Galaxy yeah. Quest is <laughs> fucking one of the best Star Trek movies ever made. <laughs> We're we're Galaxy Quest now. <laughs> I'm stuck in a room with three cynical old men talking about Star Trek. I don't. I don't <laughs> I'm in the worst timeline. You're wearing a Texas A&M hat from like 1980, which is interesting because my entire my, all of both my sisters went to UT, so I'm like really insulting the fam right now. That Sorry, hat, everyone. That hat is almost twice as old as you. With any luck, one day you'll be a cynical old man. No, stay. Be a cynical old man with us. No. So, Nina, <laughs> you have to work hard at it, Jordan. <laughs> so, Nina, tell us the tragedy about what you are currently experiencing and how it is actually fun. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> Great segue. I can't think of why it's fun, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> You're wearing a cool hat with cool dudes. <laughs> I'm like, like, kind of jittering in my seat, like, like anxiously, like, sweaty palms again. Like, what is happening? I'm looking for the exits, like, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> okay, so we we can bring it back home here. Please do. Um, <laughs> I think we've all told a lot of personal stories. We, we've broached uh, the topic of you know, why tragedy is important to making an interesting campaign. I guess we've kind of hit some DM notes there. Anybody have any more of those before we maybe would, look at this from a player's perspective? Yeah, I would like to talk more of just how to use tragedy to 
to make the fun, to increase the fun. As a DM, right? Or either way, hmm. um, either gonna, as a player. Yeah, I was going to ask um, how to implement tragedy in a game without overwhelming the players or everyone else playing with like a tragic situation that isn't fun. Mm-hmm. I, let me take that for a second. Because run with it, the, Arguably, I've probably run one of the more tragic games that any of us have been a part of. You'd be surprised what kind of tolerance players have for tragedy. And I've intentionally pushed the limits because at first I didn't know. I I had no idea. Like it's I don't I don't care how many fucking role playing blogs you read, you're never gonna find anyone who's like, I know. Put all of your group in a room and set off a bomb. <laughs> you're not gonna find that as DM advice um, anywhere. Uh, set off a bomb set by an um, autistic spectrum boy <laughs> who got wrapped up in a counterculture movement and misinterpreted it to be a terrorist I cell. Forgot, a counterculture about that was caused by one of the player characters. <laughs> Jordan, that made me cry. Like, I, know, I you, forgot. I, I had a moment. I know. Your reaction to that was one of the reasons that I, I wanted to do I this I think topic. I've entirely repressed it. Wow. Yeah, you had to go in the other room. I did, like, yeah. Well, okay, well... Center yourself. Well, I mean, okay, the, yeah, amount, of times that I to, that. the, the amount of times I had to leave during that game um, is not entirely about the game. Sure. Like, I think the one time that I actually had to leave the room for, like, an in-game situation was when we realized who'd set off the bomb, and mm-hmm. I just feel like, okay, I just need to, like, center myself and, like, maybe drink some tea and, like, cry a little bit. I'll be back, though, don't worry. So... Could, could you recount what that experience is, was like for you as a player slash character that whole session? <laughs> I'd rather not. Like, I'd really rather not. Okay. Like, I'm, I, it was, I don't know why it hit me so hard is, is why I'm struggling here. Because there were a lot of bad things that happened in that game. And you've said, I feel like you've said worse things to me and I've been fine. Almost certainly. Yeah, so like, I have no idea why that one hit me that hard, but... And I don't fault you for it. Like, it was still a fun game. That was still an interesting plot point. I I was entirely surprised that it affected you specifically in any particular way. I, I thought everybody would be like, uh, you know, like feeling fucking bad about it because, I mean, you're put in a position where you have to, you know, violently deal with someone who is essentially an innocent due to their circumstances. And as much a victim of his, of what's going on as anyone that they victimized. So the whole thing is a, a tragic situation from the outset. But I, I in no way targeted that at you. I had no prediction I don't whatsoever. think you knew me well enough at no, that point no, to target me. Like, you do now. You could easily, you could easily <laughs> fuck me up now. Well, but. The, uh, that, that whole game was like a, an experiment to see how people would react to stuff that were real-world fucked-up things. Because you all had responsibility, so that was the built-in buy-in. And so anything that went on, to one degree or another, you were responsible for. It was all things <laughs> that happened under your watch. Who ended up shooting him? You did. You did. It was me. That, yeah. That's yeah. why. Yeah. yeah. He took a fucking sawn-off double barrel and blew his head off. That's yeah. why. No, like, I've legitimately not, like, I've had to not think about that. That kid was going Columbine in the town square... I, that's probably why it hit me hard. Yeah. Because like, I made that decision. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> do you, okay, do you guys think that we play games, uh, tabletop games, with... I, I'm, I'm not trying to come off egotistical here, but I, this is this is more uh, speaking from inexperience. I mean, this is a group that I've played with more than any other group in my life by 600%. And other groups I've played with... It, it's admittedly mostly fantasy, mostly actual Dungeons and Dragons, but my God, with this group, we've had the situation we just described. We played another game where we played ourselves in an apocalypse, which ended in ourselves, our actual friends, dying or committing suicide. We've played games with other pretty heavy themes, and I mean, I'm not going to continue this this cavalcade here, but. Another thing I'd really like to hear about is is other people's experiences with these types of, I mean, real life 
themes in in role playing games. You know, not not just the dwarf wars, mm-hmm. and I don't mean that dismissively. I just mean that in a it's a very different approach to role playing. Well, I think that what Jordan said earlier about the sine wave of how of how the campaign should go is definitely it's definitely reflected in what we play. Where the deeper the valley, the higher the peak. And that is a common theme throughout everything that we've been discussing is that we have such awful tragedies like the most beloved character in the group sacrificing themselves to save everybody else. And then that making the ultimate victory that they do finally achieve after the tragedy that much greater. I mean, sure, in in that instance... Um, talking about an an incident in Abena where Magnus sacrificed himself. Like it was two full sessions where people were celebrating the fact that you had finally won. And I don't feel like if that tragedy hadn't happened, the partying afterward would not have been as intense. Yeah. It's cost benefits, the the reward at the price. Kyle, I think you're right. And when I look back at, at the other game groups that I've played with, we do tend to play games that are a lot more, maybe serious isn't the right word, but uh, gritty, I guess. Uh, gritty seems to work. And, and I think that's because all of us are the type of people that are always kind of thinking about the darker points of life. We're all like depressive in our own ways. We're all over analytical. We're all anxious, you know, yada, yada, yada. Using role playing games as an outlet to deal with these kinds of things in a, a safe, you know, danger room kind of environment, a holodeck sort of environment. That is the best thing about this kind of game to me. That's the thing that makes it different than a video game or anything else, any other form of entertainment, is that you can put yourself in a situation, deal with really fucking terrible shit in a way that you know you're going to be able to, you know, walk away and go home and think about, you know, what you've done, what you've learned, whatever, and just use it as a simulation to think about how you might deal with similar, if not so dramatic things if they ever confront you in real life. And something that that this group definitely has more than any other group I've ever been in is trust in the person running the game. That is paramount to being able to run with such a tragedy story, such a tragic event, that the players have to trust the game, whoever is running the game. And I think that is the main reason why we are able to do the types of the types of games that we do. We trust each other enough that we can be more experimental with with the situations that we throw at our at the other people, because I've been in groups in the past where it, it's a great group of people, they get along great, but there really hasn't been that that one that trust and two that desire to kind of push into these more deeper, darker things, and that's why once you push down into the deeper, darker, the sine wave comes back up, and then you can have the greater ultimate victory or achievements. You wouldn't have the kind of situations we play occurring in a pickup group. Right. Or if they did occur, a bunch of people didn't really know each other. Maybe a couple of the players knew each other, but the DM is mostly unknown to them. Um, it'd be very uncomfortable. Yep. It would not fly. And I think that might be a, uh, I guess to bring it back around again, a lesson to be had in crafting tragedy for your game in the uh, setting you're playing in, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be all grim, dark grittiness with these very heavy themes that we've been talking about here for the past like 10 minutes. I think you need to take a look at what's going on and craft your tragedy appropriately. Maybe that's an obvious thing to say, but I think that's where as a, as a DM, that's where most of the fun comes from for me anyway. Looking at the room, reading the room, creating the appropriate story. That is true in planning a battle. Uh, you know, oh, well, I'm going to, I guess, put in uh, two extra kobolds here because they're pretty powerful now, whatever. But also true in creating the right kind of 
sine wave. Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Creating the right kind of uh, pit of the sine wave for that group. I feel like part of the gaining trust, like, if you're going to do these tr- these tragic things, I feel like, what, particularly you with Jordan, that is slowly built over time as far as um, what you um, have thrown at me or the other players that I've been playing in games with with you. Because I remember remember the... It, this was very early on and whenever I first started gaming with you, we had the conclusion of one Apocalyptia game and then we created new characters for a new game and then in the very first session of that second game somebody got bit and we had to chop his leg off. And I've seen you kind of ratchet it up (laughs) from there, just getting a little bit higher, a little bit higher, just to see, just to see how high you can go. And I feel like that's the best way to do it. You have to slowly ratchet it up Mm -hmm. because if you try to bend it too much at once, it just snaps. Mm -hmm. And in so far, I'm going to get super pretentious here for a second. Insofar as role-playing games are in some way related to a sort of uh, performance art kind of thing, like in, in as much as it's personal expression that happens in a moment and is not a, a permanent thing in any way, like all art, the really good stuff comes from pain. If you're not in some way basing it off of some kind of pain, you've got drivel. You've got just, you know, some pop nonsense. I mean, that's that's in every kind of art. You know, it, look at music. The best music that's ever been made was in times of turmoil. And the worst is when things are going well. And you mean you that's don't like true. Pharrell Williams happy? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's true on a societal level. It's true on a personal level. You know, it, it, you find an artist that is in a really horrible place, they make their best music or art or whatever. And when things are going well and they're making their millions or whatever, it turns into bullshit. It's all derivative of the stuff that they've done before, and they become forgettable eventually. Most um, clear example of that I can possibly think of is Alanis Morissette. But that's a great example. As soon as she gets a happy relationship, it's like... When she when she broke up with Dave Coulier and released Jagged Little Pill, that was like rocketed her to stardom. And then since then, she's gotten happy and has just reverted back to Canadian pop. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, to, to a large extent, the, the virtual worlds that we create for ourselves to play in can't completely escape from the worlds that we live in. We're bringing ourselves to it. It's, you know, the baggage that we carry into whatever we're doing. And I don't know anyone that is okay with how things are going, broadly speaking, regardless of where you find yourself on the political spectrum. Everyone's a little bit terrified, a little bit anxious, a little bit, you know, ill at ease and i i can't help but think that you know the what we do and what we create comes out of that to some large extent a a, a brief personal note i want to add to that is if you are trying to create art or a good DD campaign and you recognize that it is pretty darn true that anybody as an artist of any sort creates some really fine things when they are at their worst or in a uh, time of sadness, depression, what have you, um, that is not to say that you need to enter a self-destructive pattern and and find ways to kick yourself down in the dumps to think that you'll make better art uh, then. Um, Something else about art and D&D campaigns is that a lot of it has to come very naturally. It, It has to be organic. It has to be something that just comes from you with practice and, you know, 10,000 hours, uh, become a master, all that as well. But a lot of this stuff just has to happen. Um, don't, don't feel as if you need to throw yourself into a pit of despair in order to create, don't do what I've done. <laughs> Shit, life will do that for you. <laughs> you yeah. don't have to force it. What do you think, mean? Nothing with that. We're finally talking about performance art. <laughs> well, yeah, no, you're talking about how you gotta be real fucking down to make art, and that's terrifying, guys. <laughs> like, I don't want to interact with that information. You don't have to be down to create art. I, I mean, lots of people are on a high and create art that is super successful commercially, and lots of people like it, but it's 
fleeting. It's, you know, the, the hit of the summer or whatever. And, you know, maybe in years to come, people will go back and look at it and have, you know, some kind of whimsical throwback to that thing momentarily, whatever it might be. But for those things that I think are kind of timeless, I feel like, yeah, you're, you're appealing to pain. You're appealing to, you know, real deep human experience because that's what we all feel in one way or the other. And, you know, that's, that's the stuff that is kind of always relevant. It's, it's always relatable to somebody. Here's another critical point from old Uncle KP. You can be at your happiest and make amazing art, but I think a lot of times you're going to look back on moments that were difficult, trying. Those are moments where we learn. Those are moments where we realize things that we've never, that have never clicked with us before. When we're at our happiest, when we're at our best, when we're really, really riding high, we're enjoying the ride. When we're at our worst, when tragedies struck, that's when we learn more about ourselves and about other way, other, other ways to survive and other things in general. And you can be at a very great point in your life, but chances are, if you're going to write something or create something, you're probably going to look back on other moments you've had, be they trying, difficult, depressive moments of uh, failure where you learned. Those are the kinds of things that allow us to create relatable tragic storylines in games or relatable anything. I, I think a lot of people who are looking for a way out of a bad time, they don't, they don't want to go listen to, uh, because I'm happy. <laughs> Fuck that song. They're going to go listen to nine inch nails, the fragile when Trent Reznor was contemplating suicide for like a year and a half, making a fucking two disc album. The best. I, I, I think the, for me, at least, the the beauty that that comes out of of art that's born of pain and just human behavior that's out of the same thing it it's directly connected with the fact that the only time that you get stronger, the only time that that you get better at something is from stress, from struggle, from you know challenge. When we're fat and happy and everything is going fine, you you just grow soft and weak. There's there's nowhere to go from there. You know, it, it's when things are awful that you find out what you're made of and make yourself better than you were. So I, I think that goes across the board in daily experience and artistic expression, storytelling, whatever you want to talk about. It's like a law of physics. Uh, I think that's just a fundamental part of the human condition. This episode of the Your Podcast brought to you by Prozac. <laughs> <laughs> For when you lack the will, take this little pill. <laughs> Can we get sponsored by Pfizer? <laughs> <laughs> like I said, you just, whenever you're trying to craft this tragedy for your character, there everybody does have a breaking point in character and out of character. These crucibles that we might put ourselves in, they can burn away everything, burn you down to your pure essence, or they could just burn you all out. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're doing this and whenever you're adding this into your games, um, just be cautious while you've got it under the fire and, and burning things away. Just as a game master, try to make sure that you don't end up just burning the players out. Because back when I was... Uh, Particularly whenever I was in my early 20s and I was game mastering, I was one of those guys who every victory was a Pyrrhic victory. There was no, like, maybe at the very end of a campaign there was a um, a great victory, but even that had some aspect to it that, that tarnished it some. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to play in that type of game. That's like what you were talking about. Like, just, you can't just go so far bound down into the valley and then just stay there. Mm -hmm. um, balance is the most important thing of, about having tragedy in your game because just tragedy is not an emotional reward. Yeah, it's like like you were pointing out about uh, ratcheting it up. Like You gotta get to know the people that you're dealing with and it's kind of like when you uh, when you go to a party and you meet people at a party, 
you know, everybody's dressed up to look nice, you know, in front of other people. They're happy. They don't want to talk about anything that's going wrong. And when you have conversations with people there on, on that level, you don't really get to know much about the person. It's more like a marketing campaign for who this individual is. It's, you know, you, you learn about the other sides of people when you see them at the worst, you know, when it's 4 a.m. and they're sobbing like that's 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 when you kind of get a look at people's souls and but yeah you can't just go straight to that it, you gotta like figure out who your who your audience is who your fellow players are all of that and you know step into it carefully and, and mindful of what else is going on because as we've discussed before this is a role-playing as as a phenomenon is a uh, potentially very powerful and, and psychologically potent activity and, you know, handled without proper care can be very damaging and hurtful to people. So that's always something to keep in mind. I mean, you got to bear in mind these are your friends that you're putting through hell. Unless you're at a convention, in which case, fuck them. Fuck them all. <laughs> you're never going to see these people again. Yeah, rake them across the glass. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, what do you say we stop this bullshit and start rolling some dice? I'm real sad. <laughs> <laughs> This has been a production of Alien Familiar Media. You can find past episodes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. This production is protected under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, no derivatives license. Music for this episode is Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale and can be found at freemusicarchive.org.